All right. Welcome, everybody. I'm going to kick us off because it's 104 and we have a lot of stuff to get through today. Um, first, on behalf of um, the team, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. This workshop is called Enhancing Marine Aquaculture in the Tropical U.S. Methods for Sustainable Commercial Co-Cultivation of Shellfish and Seaweed in Florida. So if you're on the wrong Zoom, you can depart now. If you're, I hope that the title, though, encourage you that you are in the right place. And we have a really full lineup. We're honored today to have some really good experts in the field joining us on this call. As a reminder, this workshop is simply to provide an overview of a recently funded NOAA project. It's funded through Salt and Stall Kennedy um, to the PIs, Dr. Aaron Welch and Dr. Loretta Roberson. They are both here and will be speaking to us more formally. Um, but just to let you know, this workshop today is to give you a little background on their funded project and also provide a little bit of context on some of the seaweed culture and activities that are going on elsewhere within the United States currently. Um, so we're going to have a few presentations from some of the experts. Loretta and Aaron will give you a more detailed background on their particular project and research objectives. And then at the end, we're going to have a facilitated panel discussion. And so we're really excited also to have Anushka Conception with us and Portia Sapp and Charlie Culpepper. Um, I, I will give more formal introductions to them as we move forward. Um, but Anushka is actually very well um, acquainted with the seaweed aquaculture, and she's an aquaculture extension specialist currently with Connecticut Sea Grant, um, and her focus is on seaweed aquaculture. So I do think that Anushka can provide a lot of context as well, um, and she provides a lot of consultations within the industry in the Northeast region of the U.S. Portia Sapp is the Director of Aquaculture at the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. This is the department in Florida that is responsible for managing aquaculture in the state. And Charlie Culpepper is the assistant division director at the Division of Aquaculture at FDAC. So um, I, we believe that these two will provide a lot of context on the regulatory side of things as well. So in addition to our speakers, our panelists will help us um, provide some of that great feedback during the panel discussion when we can take more um, integrated questions from the audience. Um, with, I'll remind you, um, as I, I know that in Zoom world, we're all very familiar now with how it works, but please remember to keep your mics muted and don't accidentally share your screen if you don't mean to. Um, but otherwise, if you need anything, you can message me privately in the chat or um, message all of us in the chat, however you feel you need to move forward. So um, without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce Dr. Aaron Welch with Two Doc Shellfish and Dr. Loretta Roberson with Woods Hole. And um, I'll kind of let those two um, kick us off here with a little bit of an overview. Loretta, you wanna go first? <laughs> sure, sure, thanks, Aaron. <laughs> And thank you, Angela. This is this is really great to have this opportunity to to discuss this and talk about opportunities for Florida. So I'll just go ahead and start. Um, here we go. Oops, here we go. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So basically, I'm going to talk about. Um, the seaweed project that we have going both in Florida, Puerto Rico uh, and Belize. But basically, we're, we want to um, look at all the opportunities that seaweed cultivation provides. And um, you know, some of the applications are nutraceuticals, cosmetics, fresh food, processed foods, livestock feed, fertilizer or soil conditioners, and biofuels. And our partners in Belize, Belize have been cultivating um, this Eukima isoformi that's related to species that are grown in Southeast Asia and Tanzania on a, on a larger scale for carrageenan. But, you know, focusing here more on the, the smaller scale cultivation as we build up the industry and then highlight some of the potential eco ecosystem services these farms might provide or will provide in addition, um, which include removing excess nutrients, um, providing habitat for important species like lobsters and fish, uh, removing carbon, and then potentially protecting from, from waves. And so this work is 
uh, funded by the U.S. Department of Energy. And oops, can you see that? There we go. So the RPE Mariner program, and they're interested in having seaweed farming be used as a climate change solution and produce um, sustainable biofuels. But we know we can improve water quality through removal of CO2, nitrogen, uh, sedimentation. We can produce valuable bioproducts and reconnect habitats and protect nursery spaces. Um, we're also part of the ancient Mariner team and that because the Alaska Northeast Caribbean Initiative for Energy Technology and the Macroalgae Research Inspiring Novel Energy Resources. But the RPE program really wants it to be scalable, economical, and uh, resilient. We have a lot of partners on this project to cover everything from you know, monitoring how these farms are impacting the environment, doing modeling to understand um, where the nutrients are coming and going. Uh, we work with farm site teams, including uh, Aaron in Florida with Two Doc Shellfish um, and other partners for um, our various sites. And we are definitely interested in technology transfer and outreach and helping support and develop the um, seaweed farming industry in, in all these areas in, in the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. So we're, we're also looking at um, a variety of species as these, most of these species have not been grown um, commercially before. So we kind of have to start from ground zero and understand the biology and how they grow, what are the con good conditions they grow in, how does it impact their um, composition in terms of that either carrageenan agar content or carbon and nutrient removal, et cetera. And so that's some of the basic research we're doing here at the MBL with partners like you'll hear from Charlie Yarosh at UConn, et cetera. So what do our systems look like for growing seaweed? Well, we have several and, you know, sort of in phases. And this was um, at, in an attempt to help the governing agencies really understand the gear that we're using and also for us to test the gear and the sites and the biology. So we started with a smaller system and that's just a five line spreader bar. And this is a system that we have um, deployed in Florida with Aaron. And he can talk to, you a little, talk to you a little bit more about how easy it is to deploy this system. Um, but it's essentially five grow lines that are 200 feet long and they have a, a solid spreader bar at each end to keep them um, separated. And they just have two uh, surface buoys to, to keep the system afloat and then two anchors at, you know, one anchor at each end um, to keep it in. Um, from, from there, we go up to the, what we see a more working form design and that's the catenary array. And we're testing this um, currently in Puerto Rico, uh, but we would love to do it in Florida as well. Uh, so this one is now, you see we have four corner buoys. Um, they're variable displacement spar buoys that are meant to be able to raise and lower the farm in protection from storms. Um, and we have uh, two anchors per buoy. And then right here in this drawing, we show 66 grow lines. So that's um, 60 meters long by 33 meters wide. And it keeps the, the seaweed and whether it's, you know, the red seaweeds or um, kelp, the sugar kelp in that bottom image, um, we can keep it around say 10 feet below the surface of the water and keep everything uh, under tension. And as an example, a larger system that was deployed or has been deployed in Kodiak, Alaska with our partners at the Univers University of Alaska and Hui and um, Greenwave who are here on the call with us today. And that's been um, really uh, successful out there. From, from there, the vision, at least for the DOE, is to go even larger scale. And so they want to have at least a minimum 1,000 hectare farm design. And our vision is to have it be made of that same basic catenary design as the individual module, just larger, now 300 meter grow lines um, by 50 meters. But then we put these in arrays, you know, say five by four, um, that then can be this you know, dispersed throughout and spaced in such a way that they're not impacting each other in terms of, you know, currents or nutrient removal, et cetera. 
and just this is these are some of the tools that we're using at the sites to to better understand um, how the farm system is is functioning and impacting the currents and the state of the the algae. So you know monitoring waves and and currents. We also use things like the sound trap to um, understand when um, marine mammals are are interacting with the farm and our gear. And then using other tools like hyperspectral imaging to look at the state of the seaweed and then um, autonomous uh, vehicles that can look at what organisms are so associated with the farm. Because we've seen that even when we have no seaweed growing on the farm, fish are already attracted and, and other organisms. So, so what type of, you know, how are we increasing the, the biodiversity there? And then this is just some details about the actual um, components and the, the key components for making a stable system. So first we have these anchors and in collaboration with Ted, Ted Ocean and that's uh, Cliff Gowdy. Uh, for our catenary array, we have the, the 200 pound anchors. Uh, so two of those on, on each buoy and they're just very efficient and easy to set. And once you set them, they, they hold on really, really well. Uh, the second I mentioned these variable displacement spar buoys, so they're designed to have a, a airspace that's um, constantly at the top of the buoy, but the lower space we can um, empty or you know fill with air to raise or lower the farm as as we need to, and it can be either for storm operations or even for things like you know going deeper to take advantage of some cooler water where there might be more nutrients. And then lastly, uh, one of the, the key things is for these systems is to keep them really tight and under tension at all times. So we don't have negative interactions with uh, marine life. And so we use these dead eye tensioners uh, on the anchor lines to, to really help us keep everything tight. And you know, uh, they, they work really, really well. And then I'll end on just the sort of analysis that we did in terms of suitable areas for growing seaweeds. And this is based on, you know, um, conflict of use, but also things like um, the depth. So between 10 meters and 100 meters and temperature wise, et cetera. So we have, you know, 27 million um, hectares available within that um, southeast and Gulf of Mexico area. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to, to grow things uh, here. So on that, I will end it and hand it off to Aaron. Uh, thanks, Loretta. Um, so I'm going to hold off on my presentation until after some of the other speakers have had a chance to go. Um, but I thought I'd just start off really quick talking about um, the Salt and Stall Kennedy grant in particular that Loretta and I are working on. Um, I started farming shellfish about 10 years ago and pretty much from day one, uh, I learned that seaweed was gonna be a part of my life, whether I wanted it to be or not. <laughs> um, here in Florida, uh, especially on the Gulf Coast, shellfish leases deal with seasonal blooms of marine macroalgae every winter. Um, and so for years, we just fought the algae, um, tried to keep it off our clam beds, tried to keep it off our gear. And over time, we started really thinking about, you know, how we were spending all this time and money and energy um, keeping algae off the lease. And we, it started to occur to us that this stuff wasn't just a nuisance, that it was a, a potentially valuable product. And we started thinking about ways to not just move it off the leases, but to put it to work. Um, uh, I got to go know Loretta through some contacts at the University of Miami and we started working together. Um, Loretta got us involved in the DOE grant that she just described. Um, and Loretta and I started talking about, you know, using shellfish leases in Florida for more than just sort of monoculture of clams or oysters. How could we put that whole 3D water column to work, um, producing things that were both, you know, financially profitable and environmentally sustainable. Um, and we put together the the proposal, which is this, you know, now this grant we're working on now, which is, you know, trying to find ways to co-culture shellfish, um, Sunray Venus clams and hard clams, as well as native species of seaweed. And so we've been collaborating on this SK grant together for about a year. Uh, Loretta was just down here with uh, Scott Lindell Monday and Tuesday, getting to know uh, Tampa Bay and all of the aquatic organisms that live in it. And um, so we're working and we will be continuing to work for the next 12 to 18 months on, on this idea of using 
shellfish farms on the Gulf Coast of Florida to produce both, you know, vi viable seaweed products as well as shellfish. Um, we've got a bunch of speakers that are going to talk to some of the larger parts of the industry, some of the issues and things like that. And then I'll follow up at the end of that with um, a little bit about, you know, where our little company and our partners see, see, see seaweed in Florida and where we think it could go and, and what we need to do to get there. So um, with that, Angela, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you and uh, we can move forward with the next speaker. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, okay, so our, our, I'll just get right into it. Dr. Charlie Yerish is here with us today from the University of Connecticut. Um, and one of the things that's really so exciting about seaweed is the potential for this nutrient bioextraction and the environmental benefits that seaweed culture can provide. Um, and that's almost exactly the title of his talk, I believe. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and toss the mic to um, Dr. Yerish from the University of Connecticut. Thanks for being here today. Well, thank you, Angela. Uh, what I'd like to do is introduce uh, all to uh, seaweed aquaculture. And also just to let you know that uh, the area that I'm talking about was actually first proposed in 1991 to the US EPA, but nobody was really interested in seaweeds at, uh, at that time other than get it off your beach. And uh, that was it. However, uh, through time and better understanding what the needs are of coastal uh, managers, we put together a program on seaweed aquaculture in Long Island Sound. Long Island Sound's over almost 130 miles long, has a uh, opening to the Block Island Sun Atlantic Ocean. Uh, to the western end of Long Island Sound, you have the New York metropolitan area where you have a watershed of over 8 million people impacting Long Island Sound. Uh, when we take a look at uh, the uh, problems that we have in the region, it all has to stem back to nutrients, principally nitrogen. And uh, I had uh, requested from the US EPA to give it a chance if we can use nutrient bioextraction uh, to actually mitigate the uh, nutrients in Long Island Sound. And uh, this uh, nutrient bioextraction includes both seaweeds and shellfish. And so when we look at nutrient bioextraction, how does it work? Cultivation of both uh, groups of organisms there. These organisms are picking up nutrients, inorganic nutrients, uh, such as nitrate and ammonium, uh, from the water, for the seaweeds, and for the shellfish, organically bound nutrients, so different nutrient pools. And we can remove the biomass, and you remove the biomass, then you're removing the nutrients from the ecosystem. As I mentioned before, the number one problem in Long Island Sound has to do with too much nutrients as you proceed west into Long Island Sound, going to its New York. So the area that is in red. These are areas that have frequent hypoxic events in the New York metro area. And those areas include uh, to the far west in New York is the East River. And hypoxic events take place uh, every year. And as you're going eastward, you have less nutrients in Long Island Sound. So there is not a problem there. So why was nutrient uh, bioextraction being uh, Conducted in Long Island Sound, we were able to convince the uh, Long Island Sound study of the US EPA. Uh, also convinced, we were able to convince the, uh, the Department of Environmental Protection in New York City and the state of uh, Connecticut's uh, Department of Energy and the Environment and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And we basically uh, said to them, Look, we have another tool in the toolbox that if you give us an opportunity to show you what seaweeds can do, and then we've also done it with shellfish there, this will be important for coastal managers. And if we take a look at sources of nitrogen pollution, uh, we have wastewater treatment plants. They're doing an excellent job now in Long Island Sound. They've reached their TMDLs, but we have these non-point sources uh, agriculture and lawn going down to river systems. And then we have something that is called atmospheric deposition. These are very large inputs to Long Island Sound and they're adding to the nutrient loading. So 
uh, growing seaweeds and shellfish extracts nutrients. And we've had a lot of sponsors and participants there, just to mention some of the ones, including uh, the US EPA, uh, the Sea Grant programs, NOAA, and so forth. Uh, when we take a look at uh, nitrogen and phosphorus in the region there, notice that we never go down to uh, zero on nitrogen uh, in our Western Long Island Sound region. Uh, in Long Island Sound itself, as you're moving to the central and uh, areas, you do go down to uh, zero as you're going into the spring and summer months, in part, uh, that's after the phytoplankton blooms there. And the same thing uh, takes place with phosphorus. We have fairly high levels, but nitrogen is limiting. So we were given the opportunity to set up three experimental farms. And these farms were set up for the first time in the city of New York's history in East River uh, and in Long Island Sound uh, in an area in the uh, western end of the Sound, Fairfield, Connecticut, and then in central Long Island Sound, uh, we uh, in an area, our capelico of islands called the Thimble Island Oyster Farm uh, that was uh, owned by a friend, Brent Smith, who eventually founded the Green Wave Organization. And so we looked at uh, species to grow. Uh, we, uh, we focused on Gracilaria. We felt that was a good warm temperate crop. It had the right profile for when it would grow, uh, June through October. Uh, if it's a warmer spring, you get started in uh, late April and May. And uh, Gracilaria does have commercial value. And that's also important. You don't want to grow something that is economically not important. And uh, Gracilaria is in demand globally for agar uh, production. Also in some areas there where you can grow Gracilaria, if it's edible, it can be used as limu. And we've characterized all aspects of the Gracilaria farms. Uh, I call your attention to an excellent book that we put together, open source, readily available. It's a cultivation manual, how to grow seaweeds. Uh, first time that was done and we felt that was important. But in order to go out to an open, so open water farm, you have to be able to grow it. A nursery, we had a land-based nursery system. We start off in small little test tubes, go to big jugs. Then we go to 4,000 liter tanks and use that to give us an opportunity to grow, uh, to seed our long lines. And what I like to do is show people uh, the picture to the left, that's a, uh, that is, these are the grow lines of Gracilaria, small little 20 gram bundles. You come back in two weeks and you get uh, bundles that are well over a kilo a piece. We've had growth rates of over 16 and a half percent per day in the western end of Long Island Sound, the East River. And we've had uh, up to 1700 pounds plus of the Gracilaria. Also notice that we don't have any fouling organisms uh, on our grassland area, and that really surprised uh, many of our coastal managers. We picked the right spot, the sweet spot for growing uh, the grassland area and not other organisms. And that was very important. So if you look at nitrogen removal, the ecosystem services there, uh, we look at the Bronx there, notice that maximum uh, growth, maximum nitrogen removal is in early summer, July, uh, going into August. Uh, where you have nitrogen removal depends upon uh, the amount of nitrogen in the environment. So as you go to the west, higher nitrogen removal, go to the east, less nitrogen removal, and it uh, varies by site and season. And all this has been published in uh, many journals. So we we also decided to uh, lay out a hypothetical farm using long lines. Today, I would use some of the cantonary systems that have been developed by Tend Ocean. Uh, but if we look at the nitrogen removal there on our hectare farm in Gressel area, uh, in these different regions, uh, notice that there's a significant amount of nitrogen removal uh, from these farms. And this is important 
Now, how much of the area of Long Island Sound can you grow uh, Gracilaria? We did some estimates, we did some GIS work uh, in Long Island Sound, and uh, we laid out there uh, the plans for future growth of Gracilaria in our region. And you'd be able to do the same thing uh, along the coast of uh, Florida as well, both the East Coast, West Coast, and also in areas in where you have lagoon systems there. And if we look at our nutrient bioextraction potential, not only do you have nitrogen removal, there is also carbon removal. And that is important because there you can have an impact on increasing uh, the uh, pH as the seaweeds grow, they're removing CO2 from the water. Uh, the green boss happens to do with the other species that we were working with, which is the sugar kelp. But for grassal area, we had significant removal of both nitrogen and carbon dioxide. How does that compare to other organisms like oysters and mussels? Uh, this is a comparison there. And if you look over an annual uh, period there, uh, the seaweeds uh, compare very nicely uh, to shellfish. And this is important because nutrient bioextraction includes both seaweeds and shellfish doing their ecosystem services. And important is really uh, being able to publish the work. And we published our work. We also made open source documents and how to cultivate seaweeds, red seaweeds, brown seaweeds. And this is the first time that was readily available. We even have YouTube videos uh, for people who don't want to read manuals. Uh, the US EPA back in 1991 uh, really didn't want to give us a chance to use aquaculture techniques to do what I suggested, but in uh, 2010, we were able to get the support of a number of different agencies. And in 2013, the US EPA basically uh, gave us the best uh, designation you can get, uh, which was a shout out in their annual report. Growing seaweeds is good for the environment. Extracting nitrogen, CO2, and of course, you want to be able to have an economic crop. Now, one thing that I still feel that is important is getting seaweeds and shellfish involved in nitrogen trading programs. Connecticut has a nitrogen trading program. As you're going into the western end of the air, the sound where you have uh, a pound of uh, nitrogen having a greater impact that has a certain value. And so uh, we did some estimates about including uh, seaweeds like Brasilaria in a nitrogen trading program. And uh, this would be very significant for our growers. If you could do this for shellfish, this also would be significant. And so uh, I'm not familiar if uh, Right now, uh, Florida is considering a, nit a, a nitrogen trading program or a carbon trading program, but this is a great opportunity to give our farmers, both uh, seaweed farmers and shellfish, an extra opportunity to get awards for their ecosystem services. Now, the last thing I'd like to mention is that the Mariner program, uh, Mariner, as you've seen from the introduction by uh, Loretta, uh, has many different uh, projects there, projects that are involved in uh, enhancement for uh, designing and experimenting with different technologies for growing systems there, breeding systems there, deploying uh, uh, monitoring technologies. Well, uh, we can bring uh, the Mariner program to bear on growing seaweeds in the coastal waters of Florida. And ultimately, as I said before, you want to be able to uh, actually have the value uh, besides ecosystem services. Uh, we have the opportunity when you grow certain types of seaweeds, uh, they can be used for food, bioactive compounds, hydrocolloids like augers, minerals. And uh, so when we look at seaweed cultivation, we're really looking at making sure there's no waste in a biorefinery. And this biorefinery concept is now playing out in seaweed aquaculture in North America, as well as in Western Unit. And so when we take a look at what's going on,
Well, uh, hopefully this gives you the opportunities for nutrient bioextraction technologies. Uh, originally, we were told you couldn't do it in, in the coastal waters of New York City, but we did it. And uh, this really opens up the stage for using seaweed and aquaculture to uh, let the public understand there are ecosystem services that your farmers are provided. So let's give them an additional source of income, include them in nutrient trading programs, nitrogen, and in the future, carbon. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dr. Yarish. Um, and that timing was perfect. Um, too, because a lot of the folks on this call might have been aware of the restoration aquaculture workshop that took place in Florida uh, um, at the beginning of October. And a lot of um, our industry partners are very interested in moving forward with the potential for things like you just spoke of in that presentation. So thank you for that. We are going to hold questions until the panel discussion. So um, for those of you in the audience who might be wanting to ask a question, write it down. You can also stick it in the chat or independently write. Um, chat the speaker if you want to ask them right away, um, but we will take verbal questions um, closer to the end. Um, I'd like to next introduce Dr. Scott Lindell. He's a research specialist in marine farming at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and he will be talking a little bit about sea vegetable farming. Um, and Scott, I'll go ahead and let you take it away next. Thanks. I'm trying to share full screen here thinking about it. Can you see that? <clears throat> Beautiful. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Uh, yes, I'm Scott Lindell, research specialist here at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a case study um, project that Charlie Yarish put me up to uh, over a decade ago, where we were multi-cropping grassalaria with oysters uh, in Wakoit Bay, not far from Woods Hole. Just for orientation, um, McCoy Bay is uh, here just off of the Vineyard, Vineyard Sound in southern New England. Looks something like a, oops, looks something like a snowman here in our study site, um, <clears throat> blown up right here. We planted one 100 meter long line away from the, uh, the oyster cages and one around oyster cages here. And uh, I think Charlie gave a pretty good introduction around about grassalaria and, and uh, its useful use as a, a potential commercial product. Um, we started with Charlie's help and, and uh, Dr. Young, I'm sorry, Dr. Kim too, John Kim, um, with cultures that we had collected around Wakoit Bay. They took them back to their lab, isolated them, made sure that they were the, the preferred species, not the invasive species. And uh, we grew them up in these nursery, they grew them up in initially nursery systems. We continued that in uh, large K wall tanks um, and uh, produced a fair, about of, a fair bit of biomass from between the tanks and some outdoor tanks to begin our stocking uh, of the farm. So our objectives were purely agronomic uh, to start with, with, we wanted to compare the growth rate of these uh, uh, the grassal area planted near the oysters and away from the oysters to see if there was any uh, synergistic effects. We wanted to compare the optimal depth, 0.2 meters versus 0.6 meters, compare the spacing of the plants, whether 10 centimeter spacing or 20 centimeter spacing. These were 20 gram bundles as uh, Charlie had described, and uh, compare the uh, costs and benefits of harvesting and replanting every two weeks or every four weeks. So this is a sort of a representation, representative view of our experimental grass layer farm. Um, you can see we could uh, vary the, the depth of the lines if we wanted to. Um, and this is the kind of spacing we would uh, provide for the bundles. We had some weights to sort of keep the uh, grass layer down and floats to keep it up. Uh, so I'll jump right to the results. Um, the, the, 
one of the key things we, under, we, we discovered was that 20 centimeter spacing grew slightly faster than 10, centimeter, 10 centimeters, but we figured you'd really need to double your yield to make it worthwhile, and, and it was not. So there was just a very slight difference um, at, at both the north and the south lines. Uh, we found that two week old bundles grew significantly faster than uh, the four week old bundles. Um, note that the growth rates here are seven or 9% um, on average. So we were getting good growth rates uh, to begin with. And uh, uh, that also wasn't very different on either side of the north or the south line. We concluded that, that uh, at least at the scale that we were growing the grassal area, um, in the scale of the oyster farming, uh, we didn't see a, a benefit necessarily to the seaweed of growing the, uh, the grass layer near the, near the oysters or not. This graph sort of summarizes the environmental um, uh, factors uh, with temperature being the warmest, very close to where we started in late June with our planting and dropping from there out. Day length, the, uh, the purple triangles here um, growing uh, or staying pretty steady early on and dropping off, of course. Uh, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. That's temperature and day length is the, is the uh, steady line. Um, and you can see that we started out with the terrific growth rates, probably because we started with nursery grown plants or material that was replete with nutrients. Um, and uh, our growth rate slowly dropped off to about four or 5% toward the end of the season into October, as temperature and day length also declined. And as Charlie alluded, uh, fouling was our, uh, our biggest enemy. Um, and we found the longer that we cultivated, the more we would go, every two or four weeks, we would take material back to uh, our lab, split it and plant it back out again. <clears throat> and so there was always a chance of carrying propagules back to the, uh, the field site and, and having them continue to grow. Um, so while two weeks harvesting helped us be able to keep things cleaner, um, it wasn't good enough to prevent all fouling. So we conducted some freshwater treatment uh, trials um, late in the season uh, with two different treatments, a 15 minute freshwater bath once a week or 15 minute freshwater bath twice a week. And then we also had some controls where we didn't treat them at all. And basically we found that after eight weeks, uh, the two week, twice a week treatment was pretty effective. We didn't see any tunicates. Um, the once a week treatment was somewhat effective, but we did see an occasional tunicate. But the uh, control obviously was a total loss with uh, lots and lots of tunicates that were not gonna be marketable, at least for a food market. Um, and we suffered about a 10 to 20% hit with slower growth uh, with the handling and the freshwater treatments. Um, just to continue on the theme of bio nutrient bio extraction as a as a potential reason to to uh, harvest grassal area, um, we see here that over the course of a season, um, under our actual conditions, we only harvested about 130 kilograms uh, per hundred meter line. Um, but under the best agronomic practices, if we employed all those, we'd be near nearly 900 kilograms of grassal area which is equivalent of about 2.3 kilograms of nitrogen based on our analysis. So a one acre, sorry, one hectare uh, idealized farm with 33 lines spaced three meters apart could yield about, could uh, remove about 76 kilograms of nitrogen per season. And that's about equivalent to uh, about 200,000 oysters, oysters, which could be grown on a similar hectare basis. But you need to have a market or figure out something to do with that 28,000 kilograms of uh, grass area that you would harvest from a, a hectare. So um, our conclusions were that uh, grass area is indeed a good species for nutrient bio extraction and co-culture. Uh, as, as Aaron noted, it, it's all over shellfish farms here in the Northeast as well as in Florida. Um, the freshwater treatments reduced the fouling problem and uh, we were successful in working with a, a specialty uh, vegetable um, produce uh, buyer to uh, open up markets in New York City. We were selling, selling grass area for a while there for $16, $20 a pound. Um, and uh, they were taking all we, could, all we could harvest. And I'll just 
thank uh, the Woods Hole Sea Grant for providing the funding and uh, these associated uh, institutions. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Scott. Um, next up, we've got a couple of folks from industry rep representatives and also uh, so we've got green wave on the on the call as well as mike dole who's um, the director for bivalve restoration and aquaculture um, at stony brook university we've also got kendall barbary and lindsay olson from green wave who are going to be um, speaking to us so kendall i'll go ahead and toss the mic to you and let you take take it first all right thank you so much and let me pull up my screen here Okay, you can see the slide deck, I hope. All right, um, so I am Kendall Barbary. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, I'm the Director of Partnerships and Program Development at GreenWave. I'm kind of standing in for our Director of Training and Support, Lindsay Olson, who's also on the call, but in transit to lead a training program in Cordova, Alaska for this weekend. Um, so GreenWave is a nonprofit organization. We're a bi-coastal uh, nonprofit um, headquartered in New Haven, Connecticut, and we have a mission to train and support regenerative ocean farmers in the era of climate change. Um, so we're working mostly with people growing seaweed, um, but also a lot of people growing seaweed and shellfish. Um, we got our start, as you know, Charlie mentioned back in his uh, presentation when he and our co-founder, Bryn Smith, uh, got together and started um, kind of testing out cultivation strategies for sugar kelp on um, Bryn's Long Island Sound, uh, Thimble Island oyster farm site way back in uh, 2011 and 2012. So kind of a combination of that work and at the time Bryn being impacted on his on his farm site where he's growing oysters um, and he was heavily impacted by hurricanes Irene and Sandy and then started to realize um, not only are there uh, lots of benefits and opportunities associated with culturing um, macroalgae, in this case, um, sugar kelp, um, there are lots of environmental benefits and there are lots of economic opportunities as well. So this sort of simplified diagram that I have here is really to introduce and stress the kind of importance and opportunities of the ways that you can bring different species together. But the way this actually takes shape is, is pretty site specific. It varies from farm to farm. Um, based on the site and the scale of the operations and so forth. Um, over the, the past several years since we were founded in 2014, we've really kind of developed more expertise around um, those brown macroalgae. So we're predominantly working with people growing kelps and providing some training support and expertise um, uh, around culturing the, of those species. So at this time, we don't have a lot of that expertise um, for the seaweeds that uh, may be or could be cultured in Gulf states in the Southeast um, uh, US, um, but maybe we will get there at some point. We think we can sort of shed some light at least on the, the sort of framework um, and the way that we operate and what we see in our, our areas. Um, so uh, just kind of speaking to the different sort of size and shape of operations and how things look in different places. I'm hoping that this might kind of come through on your end, um, but uh, you got to see a few of the diagrams in Loretta's presentation and Charlie's presentation and, and Scott's presentation for like different types of array systems and ways that pe people are culturing seaweed. Um, so that can range from single line systems to the five line arrays that, I, that were at the beginning of this video shot um, and to more complex, uh, larger scale, uh, multi-line array systems. So there's really a range of technologies, a range of kind of infrastructure that's needed. Here, here you see kind of Mike Dole um, waded through a, wading through a shallow water site on the south side of Long Island that's also used for culturing um, oysters. Um, a site in Alaska that occupies about 20 acres, but the farmed area is around three acres, where you have this um, multi-line catenary array designed to uh, increase the, the productivity on a small footprint and maximize um, the revenue that can be generated there. Um, so there are lots of different types of farms. I'm not going to dig in too deep today. I'm not going to like full overview over these farm systems, but just want to give you a slice of kind of what we're working on. Um, and then I'll, I'll turn the, the mic over in just a moment to 
um, Mike Dole to support. But before I do that, um, just sharing that, you know, one of the things that we've worked on for the past few years is distilling our knowledge and expertise into an online platform that is accessible to people, uh, you know, across the states and actually around the world. Um, so we've developed the Regenerative Ocean Farming Hub. It's a free seed to sale resource for ocean farmers. The topics do really focus on those brown macroalgaes, the kelps um, that we're working with in New England, Gulf of Maine, um, West Coast and Alaska. Um, and this hub has a training curriculum with over 30 courses and 80 how-to videos. It's got interactive farm design tools where you can sort of uh, run through a few different scenarios and figure out how different site factors impact, you know, anchor design and so forth um, for a couple of the array styles that were discussed in the previous presentations, including the single line and five line array. But in the community space um, where we have, you know, over 3000 users right now on our online hub from over 60 countries, um, we actually have pretty good representation um, from the Southeast US um, and people who are pretty interested in, in culturing warm water species um, and looking at co-culture as well. So the community is a place where people are coming together to sort of ask and answer uh, technical questions, uh, meet one another um, and, uh, and discuss different like topics of interest. It's arranged around you know farm design, uh, hatchery technologies, um, industry news and science and, and all sorts of, of interesting things. So you can access the hub by going to hub.greenwave.org. I encourage you to take a look and, and join that community space. But I think next what I wanted to do is just turn the floor over to somebody who we've worked with um, uh, very closely over the past few years um, to provide some training support and um, sort of technology transfer to um, our, our friends on Long Island. So we've been working very close closely with Mike Dole um, he's the Associate Director of Shellfish Restoration and Aquaculture at Stony Brook University. Um, he's also, at this point, a, a seaweed and shellfish farmer, but has farmed um, clams and oysters, um, both for restoration and commercial purposes for, for some time. So we um, started working together with Mike a few years ago to provide some of the training support and resources so that he could then extend that to more shellfish growers on Long Island. Um, so I'm looking forward to answering some questions in a little bit, I hope, uh, but for now, I'll turn it over and let him share a little bit of um, his most uh, you know, direct farmer perspective. Um, Mike? Yeah, thank, thanks, Kendall. Let me uh, get my screen up. Okay. There we go. All right, so yeah, uh, thank you, Kendall, and uh, thank you, uh, Loretta, for inviting me um, to speak a little today. But as Kendall mentioned, I'm the Associate Director for uh, Shellfish Restoration and Aquaculture at Stony Brook, and I've really spent most of my career involved with shellfish, and particularly um, aspects of shellfish restoration. Um, I'm a restoration practitioner, uh, and you know, I've spent the better part of the last 20 plus years um, working, building hard clam spawner sanctuaries and, and the science and the monitoring that go on with that as long as working with oysters and oyster reefs. And it was sometime, uh, I guess in the mid 2000s, I was working on oyster restoration projects in, um, in New York Harbor. And I was doing some studies growing oysters in cages when I had the uh, epiphany that Oysters and aquaculture provide a lot of the same ecosystem services as they do in, in nature and in shellfish restoration. And it's an idea that kind of just grabbed my mind and, and thinking, thinking about it. And it was kind of my first, uh, when I first started thinking about restorative aquaculture, although we didn't call it that back then, I, that's, a, that's a much newer term for me. Um, but, uh, and also the idea that you could, you could make a living doing this, right? And so you can, you can have an independent life on the water growing shellfish and, and making money and having this economic benefit and at the same time doing something really uh, good for the environment. And uh, I became really passionate about this idea until I, I actually started an oyster farm in 2008. And um, uh, my oyster farm grew over time. I, I uh, uh, had a successful business and 
somewhere along the way, I realized that I was only growing oysters and I started thinking a lot about um, diversifying and crop diversification. You know, if, um, if there was ever an industry specific problem with oysters, you know, whether it be a market dynamic and the, and the price drops, or if there's some sort of environmental catastrophe, uh, disease, harmful algae bloom, or something that would affect the oyster crop, I, I was pretty much out of business. That, that was my only thing was growing oysters. And I was pretty much, um, pretty much my business is emblematic of, of uh, aquaculture on Long Island, um, even to date. Um, so Long Island, where we, um, you know, we have a beautiful island surrounded by a number of estuaries. And there's a number of um, aquaculture programs surrounding Long Island. So um, there's some statistics over here on the on the left, but uh, there's about 51 small farms. You know, these are all small, small owner operated farms for the most part with less than 10 employees. Um, but the one thing in common is everybody's growing nothing but oysters. There is no, the whole industry in New York is, is oysters. So this idea of crop diversification was really on my mind a lot. And, uh, you know, sometime, uh, I, I put the year 2011 up, but I was visiting with a friend up in Maine who was also growing oysters. And he pointed out to me some people that had just started growing kelp in Maine. And I was very intrigued by this idea. No, I, I, you know, I had no idea why they were growing kelp or I knew nothing about it, but just the fact that they were growing something else I found very intriguing. And, and short after that, I heard of a, uh, of a person named Brent Smith who was growing it even much closer to home in, in Connecticut. And um, again, very intrigued that this was happening right here. Um, you know, I'll jump forward a few years after that, but um, you know, as, as uh, Kendall had mentioned, um, I got to meet Brent probably around two seven around 2017 years later and um thanks to bren and the, and the folks at green wave they're the ones that taught me how to grow kelp and uh which i've been um uh has really been a big part of my work for the last five years and sharing that that knowledge and technology to farmers on long island um but you know why kelp you know why was that so intriguing why seaweed and not another shellfish crop and i have to say for me the first thing that really caught my attention about kelp is it has an opposite growing season from oysters. Now, this is uh, something that might not be relevant down in Florida and in tropical regions. I'm under the impression that there really is no seasonality and everything's just growing all the time year round. But, you know, in the Northeast, um, shellfish go kind of dormant in the winter and the work for an oyster farmer becomes a lot less during the winter. Um, you know, really, it's just harvesting, but you don't have to keep up with biofouling or tumbling the oysters or, or you know, cleaning cages or anything like that. So there's a lot of downtime. And to be able to shift gears in the in the cold months over to a new crop, you know, is a very intriguing idea. Um, you can divert your resources, your, your boat, your labor um, from shellfish, from oysters in the warm months to, to seaweed in the cold months. And, you know, uh, I would have a lot of seasonal employees. And so the thought of having seasonal employees and keeping them year round was very intriguing. Um, also, the fact that, you know, being that we're dealing with the 3D um, uh, space that we can vertically integrate seaweeds with shellfish and we don't have to replace one crop for another. So we have additive revenue streams, you know, um, unlike, you know, farming on a 2D um, surface on land where you might have to replace your, you know, tomatoes with, you know, cucumbers or, or whatever it be. But we can integrate this all together in three days. So it's, it's additive revenue streams, not uh, replacing. Um, also, I, I became fascinated with all the different potential markets for kelp, you know, when you, um, as an oyster farmer, I'm pretty much dealing with one market, right? And that's the food market. And even, even like a sub-segment of the food market, it's really mostly getting sold into the half-shell raw, um, uh, market. And so, you know, with seaweeds just really opens up, um, market diversity as well as crop diversification is market diversification. And um, so I found that really intriguing. And, you know, it really became evident how important this was uh, during the COVID pandemic when a lot of restaurants closed and we lost that half shell market uh, pretty much. Um, and to be able to have other markets, maybe to keep a business going through tough times like that was very, very, uh, also very intriguing to me. And then combine that all with the fact that it's another extractive species, another zero input crop, you know, um, 
that has this restorative function of nutrient bio extraction. And um, um, so a really nice complement to oysters in that way too. So, you know, for a lot of good sound business reasons, it made a lot of sense to add um, uh, seaweed and, and in particular kelp to my farm, except in New York, there was no path forward. And to date, there still um, has not been any commercial seaweed farming in New York. So New York is very behind the eight ball compared to other states in the Northeast. Um, uh, the reason being there is no regulatory structure in place yet for seaweed um, cultivation, and uh, but it's coming. Um, and in fact, I think this will be the first year where there's actually going to be permits issued for commercial kelp cultivation in New York. Um, but I didn't, you know, let that stop my interest in seaweed and, and passion for it. And um, it's really become a big focus of the research I've done at Stony Brook University since since 2017 and having met Green Wave. And, um, you know, and over the course of this research, a lot of things have emerged, which I never even thought about as, as an oyster farmer. And this is just one thing, uh, uh, a recent study from the lab I'm working with um, in the lab of uh, Dr. Chris Gobler, but just looking at the impacts of growing seaweed on the local water chemistry and in, in particular pH. And, you know, as these seaweeds are doing photosynthesis and sucking up carbon dioxide, it's having an, an impact, a measurable impact on the localized water quality around the seaweed where there's small increases in pH. And, uh, you know, we've measured this with continuous sensors that we put in the field, which you can see in the picture on the right here, uh, where we've put these in, in, in um, these sons directly in seaweed lines, outside seaweed lines, different distances. Um, and not only that, we've measured growth of oysters inside seaweed and outside seaweed, and have found a significant increase in oyster growth when they're growing in seaweed than, than outside. So um, there's other benefits to an oyster farmer of possibly adding seaweeds and these benefits to, to oyster growth. Um, other research going on in our lab is looking at um, interactions of macroalgae with harmful algae, uh, microalgae um, blooms. And um, we also are finding a, a protective zone around seaweeds against harmful algae. Um, uh, one thing that would be really interesting that 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 we found is um, uh, with the with the red tides alexandrium, which produce uh, of course produce a toxin, which can shut down mussel fisheries and uh, and other shell fisheries. Uh, when mussels are grown with kelp, uh, we've measured uh, significantly lower toxic uh, toxin accumulation um, in the presence of alexandrium. Um, and that's because it's, it appears these cells, these harmful algae cells are lysing in the presence of, of macroalgae. Um, and I won't get into the mechanisms behind that, but adding seaweeds to the point, the general point here is adding seaweeds to shellfish farms can have a real lot of growth benefits. And in addition to having the, these business benefits I talked about, but actually benefits to the oyster crop. <clears throat> um, you know, very quickly, I've spent the last four years, I'm entering my fifth fifth year growing kelp, but growing kelp all around Long Island in these different estuaries, um, uh, figuring out different systems to grow it and whether it be shallow water or, or deep water, measuring the growth and then measuring the potential ecosystem services and nutrient bio extraction provided by these different grow methods. Um, you know, one thing I want to point out, and this is not really, um, this is something that's probably obvious, uh, but, you know, just like oyster farming, there's, there's good areas and bad areas. So as you're considering places to grow, you know, seaweed in Florida, um, you know, definitely take a geographic perspective and try different areas. But this is just showing some of the sites um, around Long Island growing. This is all that time of the harvest. And you can go from kelp being, you know, 12 feet long and over 10 pounds per foot of line uh, you're looking down at the picture at the bottom right in an area that's a lot more um, nitrogen limited, um, you know, having very poor growth and, and paled colored kelp. Um, but there's definitely a wide range of, uh, depending on where you grow, it matters a lot. Um, we, um, uh, you know, some of our best yields, I just put this up to show, you know, we've grown kelp and this is in shallow water too, but, but kelp up to 12 feet long, up to 11 pounds per foot. Um, which is really just a, ma a massive amount of biomass that can be uh, produced in five months. Um, and if you want, this is just wanted to show this here to give you a perspective of a 12 foot kelp blade. This was grown in two feet of water off Long Island. Um, 
But my point is here, you can, with this species, grow an incredible amount of biomass, um, which is great for nutrient bio extraction, if you're, if you're considering that. Um, um, these are just some calculations of a mock farm design with the yields that we've got, uh, got but um, on a one acre farm, um, you know, we could put 40 200 foot kelp lines at five foot spacing. I've done that. It, it, it's I haven't put 40 in, but I put I put the lines at five foot spacing, which is which is fine. We've gotten 11 pounds per foot at peak biomass. Um, so that's in one season on a one acre farm can produce up to 88,000 pounds of kelp per acre, which is just kind of of um, mind blowing. Um, and converting that to nitrogen, that's 166 pounds of nitrogen. And on Long Island. Um, you know, nitrogen is one of our, too much nitrogen going into our coastal waters is really the, the core of all our water quality problems. And, and uh, a lot of work is being done on land to reduce this nitrogen inputs, including uh, in Suffolk County, uh, which is mostly septic systems, but mandating that uh, septic systems be upgraded to these innovative alternative septic systems that remove nitrogen, um, which are quite expensive. But just to do the conversion of what that 166 pounds of nitrogen means, that's the equivalent of 14 of these innovative alternative septic systems on homes. Um, and again, that's just one acre and that's in five months over a five month uh, growing period. Um, but the consideration, um, the other consideration I just wanna bring up with all this is when you can grow that much biomass, what the heck are you gonna do with all of it? Um, our bottleneck right now is processing. Um, so it's great as a farmer to be able to collect some kelp, go to a restaurant and sell it fresh. A um, lot of benefits there. Besides the extra revenue, it's really you know great for building relationships with, with your chefs and your customers. It's a new product. The chefs get very passionate about it. So really, uh, in that way, across marketing helps, helps the oyster business. Um, but there's only so much you're going to be able to sell fresh to local restaurants and chefs or even distributors. And we're still left... Um, you know, with tens and tens of thousands of pounds of what to do with. And um, of course, seaweeds, you know, cannot be, uh, they, they go bad pretty quick. So they got to be shelf stabilized either through drying or freezing. So the processing end um, is labor intensive. Um, you know, I'm doing it the good old fashioned way by hanging, hanging kelp in a greenhouse I have out at Southampton. Um, but this really, um, uh, again, it would be very hard to scale. And so uh, the processing end is where our bottleneck is is at. Uh, we know we can grow it. We can grow a lot of it. But um, what are we going to do with it after after we grow it? And uh, well, I'll leave you off with that. But one of the things I do with my extra kelp is I put it in my uh, gardens. And um, and this is one of the also the areas of research that we're we're investigating is using seaweeds as soil amendments, uh, closing that nitrogen loop. So instead of adding new fertilizers to our crops using seaweeds to extract nitrogen out of the water and then putting them on land. Um, and so we have a lot of research going on with that right now, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to end it there. Thank you. Thanks, and, Mike. Yeah, yeah, let me just oh. figure out how to my, stop my share here. Um, well, how, how, uh, if you just like go down to the bottom and see where that, share. There we yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. It, it, for some reason it moved to the top, but I just found yeah. it. There. Thank you. <laughs> Sure. Thank you. That was fantastic. I think um, I think now what we're going to do is we're going to bring Aaron and Loretta back up to the to the front, kind of bring this back home to Florida. We've heard about some examples where seaweed culture is active and ongoing in a larger capacity on the th throughout the U.S. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit. I think Aaron, you're going to probably kick this off about this particular project and. Um, some of the business applications and market reality for the state of Florida and for some of these more subtropical and tropical systems. Uh, yeah, that's right. I'm still muted. Um, I can hear you. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I've got a quick presentation um, and everybody's presentation has been uh, fantastic and illuminative. Um, Michael, I was, <laughs> I was really happy to hear a lot of the things you said because um, I'm going to echo some of them. Um, you're obviously farther down the road than, than two dock shellfish is, but a lot of the questions that I have that I'll talk about in this presentation, you, you sort of touched on, um, in your presentation. So, um, without further ado, I, I've got a presentation sort of focused on what, um, two docs is doing and what we're thinking about when it comes to the, 
to the seaweed business as a component of our overall business, some of the challenges that, that we see down the road and, and some of the bridges that have to be crossed before you know, we can make this uh, a viable business. Um, so I'll, without going any further, and I'm gonna share my screen and um, we will start. So I'm hoping y'all can see that. Um, so yeah, I've, I've introduced myself already, but I'm Aaron. Hey, Aaron, just put it in presentation mode. Oh yeah. Just How's that? Perfect. All right, great. So yeah, I've introduced myself, but I'll do it again. My name is Aaron. Um, I'm with a company called Two Doc Shellfish. Um, I'm also an adjunct professor at the University of Miami. Um, I started farming clams in 2012, mostly as a hobby. Uh, four or five years later, it had turned into a, a full-time job. Um, we farm uh, mostly clams, a little bit of oysters uh, in the Tampa Bay region and up off Cedar Key. Uh, which is uh, farther north, up close to the Panhandle. Um, we have a small hatchery and nursery. Uh, our hatchery is over in Fort Pierce, Florida, and we have a little nursery in St. Petersburg. Um, why are we interested in seaweed? Well, we got interested in it, as I mentioned earlier, because we're already growing it. Um, every um, winter, it starts in late fall, right about now, and it lasts through late spring. We see it varies from year to year. There's really heavy blooms and, and there's less heavy blooms, but every year we see a bloom. Uh, last year, we had a particularly heavy bloom on our, on our farm in Tampa Bay. Um, the second week of January last year, our crew spent a week uh, pushing a bloom of mostly grass salaria off a plant of about 2000 clam bags. Uh, the, the seaweed had rolled in six to seven feet high on our leases. Um, it was literally overhead for the divers. We use a variety of techniques to move it around the leases. We built big seine nets. Uh, we just send divers down with draggers. We drag chains. Uh, we use the prop wash from our boats to push it around. Um, we spend a lot of time and energy trying to get seaweed off of our leases. Um, and and for, for pretty obvious reasons, um, at small levels, you know, a foot or so of grass layer rolling around on the lease is generally not a problem. But when it starts to stack up to three or four feet high, it reduces water flow, that reduces growth. Um, when the spring rolls around and it starts to warm up, if you haven't kept up with your biomass, uh, some of that oxygen comes out of the water as the temperatures rise and a lot of that biomass will die and it'll create like a layer of anoxic goop on the clam beds um, and that kills animals and it kills them in a hurry. Um, it takes a ton of time and energy and money to take care of it and we're removing tons of biomass from our leases every year. And as I mentioned earlier, um, as we started to grow our little business and started to have you know, significant plants, um, we realized that you know, this stuff has some potential value and maybe there's a way to turn all this labor into something more than just a cost for our operation. Um, I got to know Loretta through the University of Miami and, and, and with Loretta and with our partners at Natuno um, and with some of our friends at the University of Florida, over the last few years, we've started thinking about ways to make this something other than just a nuisance. Um, so for us, when we start thinking about it, I mean, the first thing I think any grower thinks about is what species. Um, over the last couple of years, we've worked with Ucuma, which is the top picture. Uh, we've worked with Calupra, which is uh, sometimes referred to as sea grapes. That's the middle picture. And we've worked with Gracilaria. Um, and there's some other ideas that we've kicked around too, but those are the three for now we've worked on. Um, and, and so that's sort of all, you know, that's sort of the first question you've had is what species can we grow? Um, Right now, we think that Gracilaria is the best candidate for culturing all our waters. Um, all we've done with Calupra is kill it. Um, we've had some success with Ucuma and that we can keep it alive for extended periods, but we really haven't been able to produce any biomass. Um, it's taken a few go rounds with Gracilaria, but we've started to think we have a system for producing it in our waters that works. Um, we've gotten some reasonably good results. Uh, we're getting a, in the wintertime 2% growth a day, give or take. Uh, and we're doing it with really limited input. So for now, we're, we're focused on Gracilaria as well as Ucuma because you know, we're, we see the potential there. We're not sure Calupra is ever gonna be uh, a viable species in, in culture on our leases, but maybe down the road, we'll revisit it. Um, like Michael was talking about earlier though, we have a lot of questions about how we're gonna market this stuff. And this is something I think that anybody who's considering a seaweed is gonna have to think through. There are a ton of potential market applications for it. Um, Scott mentioned the fresh market, um, and 
that is for sure a possibility. Um, with, with our shellfish business, we do occasionally get requests for seaweed. Um, I'm just not sure there's enough demand in the restaurant trade in our area uh, to build a business around. I mean, how many restaurants would buy it? How many markets would buy it? Who would distribute it? Uh, and I'll get into regulations going forward, but we're not sure how the regulatory universe would work if we were selling this as a fresh product. Again, there's a lot of applications for it, salad, soups. Uh, Calupra was exciting to us at the beginning because of the potential to manufacture vegan caviar. Um, but we're not sure how big that market actually is. Um, the aquarium trade, again, maybe. Um, here in Florida, the aquarium trade is a big business. I think it's the single largest sector of the state's aquaculture industry. And seaweed could be used in a variety of applications and a variety of kind of tanks. Again, I don't have a good sense of how big that market is. Um, I don't know how it would get distributed uh, and I don't know how it would be regulated. I also don't know um, if it wouldn't make more sense if we were trying to service the aquarium industry, if we didn't just pull the stuff wild off the of leases and sell it that way in the winter time. Um, you know, there's the market for agar and carrageenan. and there's some other um, derivative compounds that are sold too, like in the pharmaceutical and cosmetics industry. We know that as late as the 1970s, there was some small scale agri processing going on in Florida on the East Coast. Um, they were using wild harvested grass as a feedstock. But we don't know about that business either. I mean, it's a volume business. Um, I've got a table there on the right hand side um, that's from the latest FAO report on seaweed production. Uh, the amount of seaweed that's being produced in places like Indonesia is massive, millions of tons, Yukuma and Gracilaria. Um, you know, I don't know that it's ever going to be possible for an American producer to get to these volumes, maybe. Um, but there'd be a lot of questions about the regulatory environment, who would process it, who would buy and things like that. Um, and there'd be a lot of questions about the cost to produce. I mean, I don't know that we could be cost competitive with producers in Southeast Asia. So perhaps that's a market, but you know, we're just not sure. Um, there's fertilizers. Um, I think Michael talked a little bit about that. Um, maybe. Um, I've had some of the grass area we've pulled off our leases tested. It is rich in micronutrients that gardeners and other agricultural users want, zinc, manganese, those kind of things. And I mean, there's already an industry set up around um, organic and seaweed-based fertilizers. So maybe there's some potential buyers out there that would be interested in having an alternative source of uh, biomass, but I don't know. And I don't know what scale would be required to service those markets. And again, as always, I don't know who would process it. I don't know how the logistics would work. Um, one market that we're very interested in here is um, feed additive for cattle. Um, red seaweeds, especially asparagopsis, have high levels of bromoform. Um, that has been shown to reduce methane emissions in beef and dairy cattle a lot. Um, in some cases, the literature indicates as high as 90 plus percent. Um, other papers show, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent. Um, there are some companies that are working with it. A company called Blue Ocean Barns, uh, which is in Hawaii, has developed a product they called Bromonata, which has gotten a generally recognized as safe designation from the FDA. Uh, and apparently it works and they're working to scale that business. Again, that's asparagopsis. Uh, Grassalaria is a red seaweed. Um, maybe it has bromoform, but we don't know. Um, we're going to find out. We've been working with our partners at Natuno and the University of Florida to have some of our Grassalaria tested to see whether or not it has bromoform. Um, and I think that that is a potentially exciting possibility. Um, it's a little bit under the radar for some people, but Florida is an enormous uh, cattle producing state. I think we're actually only second to Texas. So if that was something that growers, you know, cattle producers in this state wanted, it might be something that we could provide. Obviously, there's regulatory issues. Bromoform is actually toxic. So the FDA is going to be involved uh, in any feed additive uh, that's being fed to cows. Um, again, processing and scale questions are out there. We just don't know. Um, and then there's nutrient credits. Um, our regulators at the Department of Ag and Consumer Services Division of Aquaculture, FDACs, uh, they've recently started considering how to get nutrient credits uh, to growers who are producing both shellfish and seaweed, and that's exciting. Um, I think we don't have all the data. Um, we don't know how much carbon, nitrogen are being taken up um, by the different species that are produced by growers in the state, so they'll have to generate some more data. Um, we don't know how much the credits will be worth. I'm not sure if it'll be financially worthwhile. Um, and I don't know what the paperwork would look like. Um, and <laughs> I'm a farmer for a reason. And then, the, so we have all these questions about markets. Um, 
we love the idea of being in the space. Um, we think there are applications, but all of these markets leave us with almost as many questions as answers. Um, and we wonder about the regulations too. I think Michael mentioned it. Um, I don't really know what a regulatory environment would look like for seaweed production. Um, is it food? If it's food, the FDA is involved and there's gonna be rules about heavy metals, other contaminants. Um, there'll be rules about post-harvest handling and processing. Um, there'll be a lot of things that we'll have to understand and be able to navigate if we're gonna successfully harvest, process and ship this product to any of the markets I just mentioned or any of the ones I haven't mentioned. Um, here in the state of Florida, um, we farm in what's called SHAs, shellfish harvest areas. Um, right now I'm under the impression that seaweed production would probably have to occur in shellfish harvest areas. Um, that's gonna limit the amount of real estate available to do this. So if you're thinking about a more volume application for seaweed production, like agar or carrageenan feedstock, um, you're gonna need a lot of real estate. I think there's 45 or 50 SHAs. Um, in the map on the right, the blue lines are, a, oops, sorry, a rough representation of the lower Tampa Bay shellfish harvest area, 4802. Um, that's not a huge amount of bottom. Um, I think the, the state would want to, and I know Charlie and Portia are on this call and maybe in the panel discussion, we can talk about this, but um, you know, right now FDAX believes and probably rightly so that they need to limit seaweed production to existing SHA so they can monitor water quality and, and keep us out of trouble. Um, which is understandable, but it would limit, you know, what is possible if, if somebody really wants to scale a seaweed business in the state of Florida. Um, there's an issue with our programmatic permits. Right now, FDAX is authorized to, and this is a, actually a great thing that's happened recently, FDAX got a programmatic permit that allowed them to authorize seaweed production in the state of Florida. That just happened in the last year or so. But that programmatic permit limits the kind of gear that FDAX can authorize. And essentially, FDAX can only authorize um, pre-existing shellfish production gear to be modified for the use in shellfish, or sorry, in seaweed production, that could potentially limit innovation in different ways of, of, of going about cutting up the onion. I'm not clear whether or not, um, and it, it relates back to the SHA question, I'm not clear if um, seaweed could be produced in land-based flow-through systems like tank systems, especially if those um, flow-through systems were taking intake from an area outside an approved SHA, um, I don't know. Um, and I don't know what would happen uh, in the case of a harmful algae bloom. This is central Florida. Uh, the map on the right-hand side of the screen actually shows you the current red tide status on the Gulf Coast of Mexico as of yesterday. Uh, the color dots show bloom concentrations of red tide. If we're producing algae for a non-food application, are we shut down for red tide? Are we not? I, you know, I don't know. If we're producing for a food application, are we shut down due to red tide? Uh, what about pyrodinium and some of the other harmful algaes we experience uh, here on the coast? What would make products safe and not safe? I mean, what are the standards? How would we predict and, and manage harmful algae blooms? So there are other questions I could go on forever about it, but the point is, is in addition to sort of wondering about the markets, we wonder about how we would be regulated if we tried to really turn the screws and scale a seaweed business here in Florida. There's some other challenges. Uh, Michael, you mentioned your impression that in Florida, things just grow all year round. Actually, not really. Uh, every, every human being and animal in this state is miserable from July until the end of September, at least, because it's hot and muggy. It rains too much. Um, we've killed a lot of algae in the summertime in the Bay because it's just too murky and hot. Um, we think that seaweed in Florida is mostly a fall through late spring crop, uh, regardless of the species. The water is more clear. Um, more photosynthesis, happier critters, less biofouling, things like that. Um, I've been working with Loretta and her team at um, on the RPE grant for the offshore site, which she discussed earlier. Um, it's not part of this Salt and Stall Kennedy grant, but it's another system. I've now pulled that rig out of the water three times in the last 20 months uh, to get out of the way of hurricanes. Um, we've had two in the last month here. Um, I've also had to pull the offshore rig out of the water twice due to um, user conflicts, folks driving their boats through the rig and, and cutting it up and messing stuff up. And we have similar issues on our inshore leases in Tampa Bay with the, with the salt installed program. Um, and then expertise. Uh, we've gotten a lot of great help from Loretta, but she can't be here every day. We've gotten a lot of great help from Scott, a lot of help from uh, Cliff, but they can't be here every day. And so we're figuring a lot of stuff out on our own as we go. Uh, we're making a lot of mistakes, trying not to make the same ones twice, but 
there isn't a great local ecosystem of, of um, extension that can help us with some of the questions we have. That loops back into our question about gear. We've tried ropes with clips, ropes with ties, ropes with tube nets, um, other systems. We're not 100% sure the best way to scale any kind of production. And we're gonna have to work through that when it comes to gear. And, and then we have the question, since we see it every winter, does it make more sense just to harvest it wild? Scott and I had a discussion about that uh, Monday and Tuesday this week when they were on site with us um, working on our grassland area and Yukima project here in Tampa Bay. So we've got a lot of other challenges and questions that we're thinking about as a commercial operation. And that's just a sample of some of them. Uh, in conclusion, despite all our questions about the market and what it looks like, despite all our questions about the regulatory universe, um, despite all the other challenges that we see out there, uh, this stuff has a lot of value. And um, we think in the medium term, this is something that is, makes a lot of sense for growers in Florida. Uh, Michael, you mentioned it too. I hate the fact that I'm only capitalizing on the bottom six inches of my lease is growing clams. I want to put the whole things to work. Um, our regulators have been great about giving us permission to use water column. So let's figure out a way to add production to our you know, acreage out there in the Bay. Uh, we're working with various partners, uh, some of which I'll thank at the end of this. Um, but we need to keep doing that research. And we're hoping that over the next year or two, our regulatory environment will, will become more clear and we can start to move forward with some of these questions we have. Um, I need to thank NOAA for funding our work. I need to thank the Marine Biological Laboratory, Scott, Loretta, uh, Cliff, uh, Sea Grant. Um, I think Leslie Sturmer's on this call. Angela set this whole thing up. Uh, our regulators at the division have, you know, I think in some states, people really have heartache with their regulators. We've got great ones. Um, Sometimes they frustrate me, but 90% of the time, uh, they've been really supportive and helped us move these projects forward. And uh, our partners at Natuno have funded a lot of our work and I need to thank them as well. And that's all I got. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. Um, okay, from, from there, I think what I'm gonna ask is for all of our presenters to go ahead and turn your cameras back on. Um, and also, I'd like to invite our um, other invited panelists to kind of pop on if they want. Um, Portia Sapp and Charlie Culpepper, whichever one of you drew the short straw, um, or both of you is great, um, either way. Um, and then also Anushka, if you are available and able. Um, Anushka, again, is the aquaculture extension specialist with Connecticut Sea Grant. Um, and her focus is actually on seaweed aquaculture and seaweed processing and marketing. So she has a lot of input and perspective from, from the Northeast as well. So, um, you know, we can, we can do this. Um, probably the best way to do this with this number of folks is if you have a question, if you know how to use the raise the hand button down at the bottom, there's a little button that has a smiley face and it says reactions underneath it. It might be at the bottom, but wherever it is on your Zoom screen, it says reactions. If you click it, there's an option to raise your hand. Um, so you can either do that or we could try out if people just want to unmute, but sometimes that can get kind of cacophonous. So um, we might just want to try the raise your hand button first, but if nobody raises their hand, um, we can we can move on from there. So let's go ahead and open the floor. If anyone has particular questions for any of our presenters today, or just about the general viability moving forward for seaweed production in, in the subtropics and tropics, um, feel free to, you know, broach that also. I see there's a question in the chat. So can someone touch on the potential for seaweed die-offs of the tropics caused by stress, induced variations in salinity, temperature, fouling, predation, epiphytes, pollution, and siltation? Um, I think I can say briefly that Aaron touched on this and that, um, you know, we're still learning about what cycles those are in um, in Florida and, and other places for our other sites with the DOE project. Um, I think right now we really haven't seen evidence of disease, but certainly um, seaweed gets stressed when it gets warm. And unfortunately, the last couple of years, we've seen extremely warm summertime temperatures. And so what, you know, Mike, you said, we originally thought we could grow things year round, but um, as uh, Aaron pointed out, those, those really warm July, August, September is really not um, doable for the present climate state that, that we're in and will probably continue in the future. 
Um, we haven't seen uh, much predation at, in some sites, except for this week. <laughs> Aaron can talk a little bit more about that. Um, but we do have issues in the tropics with um, epiphytes and biofouling. And I think it really varies from um, year to year and site to site. And as, as Mike mentioned, it's really um, a good practice to test multiple sites and at different seasons to see, you know, what what site does better and what species do better at, at that site. Yeah, I can add on to that a little bit. I mean, uh, with the Ucuma trials we've run, um, we, we, we were able to keep it alive and even see a little bit of growth, but it didn't grow great. And, and one thing we found was there was some fouling on it. With, with our grass salaria work last winter, we didn't see any fouling, no epiphytes. And I, I suspect that had to do with just the fact that it was growing rapidly uh, and we were able to harvest it and resubmerge it and then harvest it again. Um, I agree with Loretta, the, the die-off issues we've seen have been not disease related, but environmental, just too hot, too fresh. May I add on to that? Um, sort of building on some of the comments around kind of site access and, and testing out a few different sites to understand where things work and where they don't. Um, I want to point out that that's often really hard for someone who's trying to uh, enter into this enterprise in a commercial way. Unless you already have access to a site, you are growing shellfish and you're starting from there and can kind of work with other people and regulators. If you're starting from scratch, um, that's where we need the strong partnerships with the research community who can often kind of navigate that process in order to secure the approvals that are necessary to like lay that foundation um, and open the door for the commercial cultivation. Um, usually farmers are going through like a multi-month to a multi-year process to secure the leases, the permits and all the approvals that are necessary in order to put their gear in the water. And you don't always know in that case, like how it's gonna perform until you get to that point where you're farming. So like these, these kind of uh, critical research partnerships are just really key and super valuable to helping to, to expose like where it might be possible to do, where it also might be economically viable. Um, the one other point I wanted to raise, like thinking about economic viability and market opportunities, because Erin, you were talking about that, like we can grow it or we can harvest it, the wild set, but like, what are we gonna do with it? Um, one way that we've kind of addressed this on the nonprofit side and working with people who are cultivating kelp in um, New England and Gulf of Maine um, on the West Coast in Alaska, um, Greenwave launched a, a program within the past couple of years that's really centered around value chain coordination. Um, so we are doing like heavy, deep work with farmers, as well as trying to kind of develop markets and build connections between buyers and processors. Um, so they, they can make those kind of transactions and relationships and we can start to build the network and um, build the sort of domestic economy for seaweeds. Right now, um, so I'll share in the chat, I guess when I'm done commenting, like the, the tool that we developed um, and the program that we developed is called Seaweed Source. So I just added a chat to the comment. Um, and you can access a little bit of the basics through our website um, and you can apply as a seaweed grower to uh, take part in that program um, through kind of participation in the hub. We've really focused on kelp so far, but I think that if there's demand for kind of that value chain coordination across other species and other markets, that there's an opportunity to expand that programming. Um, to other areas. So I'd love to chat about that with the folks on this call at some point. Yeah, let me just, Kendall, thank you. Um, the first thing you said um, about the fact that this enterprise requires essentially a lot of failure, you got to figure it out. Um, there's no way that Two Docs does any of this without help from NOAA, Woods Hole, um, our partners at Natuno. Um, we've had the opportunity to make a lot of mistakes without having it hit our bottom line. And that sort of support has been invaluable. It speaks to the network you were talking about. Um, looping back to the second half of your comments, yeah, that's great. You know, any help we could find connecting with people who could buy this stuff and help us put it to work um, would would be awesome. So thanks. Sheila, go ahead. I see you have your hand up. Sheila, Hi, everyone yeah. is from Tampa Bay Estuary Program. Yeah, thanks. Angela for putting this all together and for all of the speakers, really interesting stuff. Um, and I definitely see a lot of potential here in Tampa Bay. Um, I guess I'm a 
seagrass biologist and I run the seagrass monitoring program for Tampa Bay and lower Tampa Bay, especially around Rattlesnake Key, typically has really productive and stable seagrass beds, as well as other critical estuarine hard bottom habitats, habitats, which are really essential stopover places for fishes as they migrate in and out of Tampa Bay. So um, just keeping that in mind, um, and because I am a habitat ecologist, I didn't really hear any of the speakers talking about the impacts of these macroalgae farms on the submerged aquatic vegetation in their areas. So I'm just wondering if anybody was studying kind of like the impacts to, to those habitats and um, either like right under the right under the farms or around the farms. I can answer really quickly and let someone else go. Um, for our siting at all the sites in Florida and Puerto Rico, et cetera, we um, uh, specifically avoided seagrass areas or coral sites and um, just to avoid any uh, potential endangerment or, or conflicts. But we, we do know that through our partnership with the Nature Conservancy who work with the um, seaweed farmers in Belize that they have grown seaweed over and this is again red seaweed, not the 12 foot long um, kelps that Mike showed us, uh, um, but they found very little impact on the seagrass bed below the farms. Yeah, I can tack on a little bit to what Loretta said, Sheila. Um, we are required to, our leases are limited to sand bottom only. Um, we've got buffer zones between our farms and any seagrass area. Uh, FDAX checks everything very carefully as well as we do before uh, any leases are authorized. So. We're only doing this over um, essentially sand bottom. Um, I can tell you that in our area, I know Rattlesnake Key pretty well. I grew up in Bradenton. Um, we're, uh, we're near Bishop Harbor and we see these red seaweed, this grass layer and all these other blooms roll in across the grass flats everywhere. Um, you know, all the stuff that we've grown so far is grass area wise, we've just used wild prop yules to grow and it's all rolling across the leases and the, and the sea grasses um, wild. Yeah, and it's we see the same pattern on the flats that we see on our leases. It comes in in the winter when the water gets clear, and it it's gone um, by the summertime. Okay, um, Charlie Yarish, and then Charlie Culpepper, you're next. Yeah, I just want to mention uh, when we had the uh, pandemic and the supply interruptions, the global supply chain, it was quite evident that the uh, auger industry was in desperate straits. And that's a low hanging fruit uh, for folks in Florida right now, either through wild harvesting or for cultivation. And uh, I would urge to uh, run some auger analyses. I was quite surprised that uh, the auger that we had from the farms in Long Island Sound uh, actually was food grade auger. I put the paper uh, in the chat, the techniques as well are listed there. That is a low hanging fruit. So if you have a large quantity of wild harvestable material, follow through on doing that. The, there is a North American need right now for auger. The biotech industry also wants it in addition to the food industry. So uh, that is uh, something that I would urge uh, folks to uh, look at very carefully for the state of Florida. I also put some other references there because I think it's important to see peer reviewed literature from all of the scientists here. Uh, so there has been a, uh, you know, a good body of work that will help Florida and uh, develop its uh, aquaculture industry. Yeah, thank you. And just so you guys know, um, for everyone that's on this call, I will compile everything in the chat and forward it out. So don't feel like you have to try and get them all copied and pasted. I'll, I'll make sure that I send an email following the workshop with all of those links. Charlie Culpepper, I noticed you had your hand up and then it's down. Did you want to say something? And then Leslie, I see you. 
Well, sure. I was going to chime in, but actually Aaron nailed the question. So Aaron knows our rules. It's always great to hear our farmers <laughs> say what I was going to say anyway. So yeah, we, the, the simple question is, you know, we, about seagrass impacts, no aquaculture leases in Florida can be cited on any natural resources is a short answer. So like Aaron said, sand and mud bottoms only. So in terms of direct impacts, there would be none. Um, I guess while, while, just while I'm on real quick, I would, uh, I, Aaron had several points I'd like to touch on, which one was, yes, you can grow seaweed in upland recirculating or, or flow through systems in Florida. We have folks doing that with seagrass and some uh, microalgae currently. So we, we have, you know, you can work with the Division of Aquaculture to permit any commercial upland facility like that. And we do have a streamlined process for intake and discharge um, for facilities, especially like a seaweed where there would be no input. Um, we, we do have process in place for that. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to touch on with another thing that Aaron mentioned was, uh, yes, we did modify our, our uh, state programmatic general permit recently to allow macroalgae to be cultured within already approved gear. Uh, but what we've been working on um, it easily three years now, but I think we're getting very close, is actually approving some submerged long line systems within our programmatic general permit. So that, that to us is really going to open up the, the possibility even for research and demonstration, which Loretta and Aaron, you know, they, I believe it was two or three years to get an individual permit for your project just to see if this works. So we're really excited that we would have, you know, it, it's going to have some limitations on it in terms of size and density. Like, like, you, like you touched on, Aaron, there, there is a need for innovation, but that individual permitting route, I think, is always still going to be there for larger farms and things like that. We're Considering it's a brand new type of industry in a brand new area in the country, we, we're excited to make any kind of general permitting success with suspended long line systems. So stay tuned. We'll be glad to announce that to everyone within this group as soon as possible. Yay. Thanks, Charlie. That's cause for celebration for sure. Um, Leslie, go ahead. Uh, a question and then just a comment. So in this show, I think in talking to you in the past, you are also doing land-based rearing of seaweed. And I'll let you answer. And then I do have a couple of comments of some history here in, in Florida as well. Hi, Leslie. <laughs> I haven't seen you in a while. Um, <laughs> hope you're well. Um, so you. there's very small scale uh, production of grass salaria in tank-based systems at the Bridgeport Aqua aquaculture high school and that was a partnership with UConn specifically Dr. Yarish um, where high school students um, learn uh, the entire soup to nuts process the cultivation the processing and then the retail side um, so while in the state of Connecticut um, at the moment there's no approved open water cultivation of grass salaria uh, for several reasons um, again, the Bridgeport Aquaculture High School is selling their grassalaria, their native strain of grassalaria, uh, for human consumption um, as a food. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, Florida does have a history of seaweed, at least research. It's all land was land based. Um, actually, started with John Ryther and Dennis Hanasek over there at Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute, and I know Dennis has looked at several species and again, all in land-based cement tanks. And I don't know if we've reached out to him to, to find out what some of those species were um, or if he, even if he's continuing on in that line of work. I also put in the chat a link um, to a dashboard, a survey of consumer um, acceptance uh, uh, results from Atlantic Corp. They just released that. It's a really interesting um, way they presented the survey results um, pertaining to farm-raised seaweed and consumer acceptance and preferences. Great presentations, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks, Leslie. Hey, Leslie, did you hit send on the chat? I don't, I'm not looking, I'm looking for that link. It I just is, wanted to make sure. There. Okay. Okay. Earlier. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. I'm doing the awkward pause so that those of you out there that might have some questions, don't be shy. I'm. I'm sorry. I can't locate my raise hand button, so I'm going to interrupt. If that's okay. Yeah, that's great. Hi, Dominique. Hi. 
Um, I have uh, two questions. Um, one, the first concerns insurance. I know that there's a lot of business and research and development going on. So I'm wondering if anyone has had an opportunity or has had experience with uh, insurers, uh, cro either crop insurance or extreme weather insurance. And uh, while there is development, um, a push for development in the industry, is it possible to arrange for, I suppose, pilot studies with insurance products? Uh, Dominique, I guess, and maybe Michael from Stony Brook can jump in on this as well, uh, or maybe Scott from the commercial side. Um, insurance for shellfish producers, and at least in my experience, is <laughs> yes, I have some experience with it, and not much of it's good. Um, we don't have very good crop insurance. Um, we have a program called NAP, um, which provides some limited coverage, mostly are limited to coverage for name storms. Um, Leslie Sturmer might be able to jump in on this as well. Um, it's pretty limited coverage. The payouts are pretty low. It's got to be a pretty extreme event. Um, I think there's some coverage for seed losses and things like that, but we don't have really good insurance. Um, you know, I've got some friends in the insurance business who've talked to me about the difficulty of underwriting shellfish farms, the potential for fraud, et cetera, et cetera. So I get it. Um, but yeah, insurance is something that would certainly help our industry. And I think a lot of the same insurance related issues that plague us on the shellfish side will, would ultimately need to be addressed um, if the seaweed industry really starts turning the screws in the state as well. It's, it's tough for us on the insurance side. We, we roll the dice a little bit more than other producers. In the 2018 Farm Bill, uh, algae was put in the Farm Bill. And in the 2019 and 2020 appropriation, there was money in there for algae crop insurance, both micro and macro. And so you have to work with your county extension agents uh, to take advantage of that. Uh, just a further comment to reflect on how difficult it is uh, to try and even acquire some of these USDA funded uh, crop assistance programs. For a new crop such as seaweed, they would require, Farm Service Agency would require um, data from several existing farms before they would even consider uh, including it in the NAP program. So what kind of data is that production, Leslie? Yes, growth survival from several farms, yep. They're not, yeah, I wouldn't say they're hard to work with, but. Um, I would. Yeah, okay, maybe they are. May I add a little bit of perspective? And I, Mike, I really want to hear um, kind of your experience too. What we've seen on our side is kind of the same, like, yes, algae is in the farm bill, making it possible for farmers to access crop insurance, but I don't know any farmers who have crop insurance or at least none who are growing seaweeds. Um, I do know farmers who maintain um, like a liability insurance for their business and a small insurance package that makes that kind of possible and is necessary um, in order to sell their products, say at a farmer's market um, or to restaurants and so forth, but not the type of protections that you might want to secure to like address, you know, disaster, crop loss due to disease and other, other things for all, for all these reasons that folks are pointing out. Mike, what's your experience? Just to follow up what Kendall said, that's right. We carry liability insurance. If, if a boat runs over somebody or somebody gets sick from a clam that was left out, yes, we have that. And that's that's pretty standard and straightforward. There's brokers that carry it, but crop insurance specifically is a nightmare. Yeah, I mean, I'm just gonna echo what was just said, but I, I'd never had crop insurance and it's been a long time since I've looked into it. So I really, I couldn't really, really even add anything uh, uh, as to cost or, or, or that. Um, and uh, I will tell you workers comp and, you know, liability, especially workers comp, very expensive, very, very, very expensive. Well, that's why a lot of employees or, you know, a lot of businesses keep employees off the books because the workers comp is a killer. Uh, but, you know, I mean, accidents do happen when you're working on the water. So it is really important to, to cover your employees. Um, and uh, so I, I, I had spent a lot of money on workers comp over the years. The only um, one thing I would want to add was, um, and this is not something to count, count on for future disasters, but after Superstorm Sandy, 
you know, which greatly impacted Long Island, um, there were um, uh, funds, federal funds available through the through the small, I guess it was the Small Business Administration, which we were able to tap into to to cover some of our losses. Um, so programs like that, following major catastrophes, and I'm sure, I mean, I'm sure Florida knows this a lot better than we do, but there, there was money to tap into, and I. You know, this is going back to 2012, but it was, you know, it was a nice sum of money we were able to get to recover some of the losses we had for for Superstorm Sandy from uh, from that. But uh, but yeah, as far as crop insurance, uh, never had it. I'll, I can jump in quickly and add in terms of at least the, you know, innovation side to be able to withstand the for, the storms. Um, that's something that we've been. Um, very conscientious or conscious of because of where we're growing in Florida and Puerto Rico that are basically targets as you know Aaron got hit twice this year and in Puerto Rico we had just put our large catenary system in the water when Hurricane Fiona passed seven miles I passed seven miles south of our farm site and we had no damage to the system it didn't move at all and performed like you know it was supposed to so I think there are, are ways to help get around this. And we, while we didn't get to test the, um, the biomass, how it would survive this, we think that um, being able to sink it down to the bottom where currents and waves are much, much less um, um, exciting than at the surface during these hurricanes, I think could really at least help mitigate some of those issues. Is it practical to try to remove your the majority of your systems from the water with, if a storm is approaching? I'm the shellfish business. Uh, I mean, I think like Loretta suggested, if you're in the seaweed space and you have systems that can be put um, on the bottom, that's a help. I think it's certainly something that anybody who wants to do this in a nearshore environment would have to consider. Um, I think if you are operating at scale in a nearshore environment, you're not putting it on the bottom to get away from these. And, you know, if I suspect that anybody who scales a nearshore operation, it's going to be like clams. Uh, you, you can't get 5,000 clam bags out of the water. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Um, so I don't know, but I suspect that certainly in the nearshore environment, nope. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. My second inquiry concerns your uh, earlier question about um, where to direct your product. Um, I, I am pursuing a, an avenue of research with another emerging market, and that is um, uh, bison ranching. Um, I have approached uh, a university research center and a, um, a feed, seaweed feed supplier uh, to partner on a research study to understand if bison can be adapted to a seaweed or partial seaweed diet. And this is um, primarily because of the water footprint of um, terrestrial feeds and the water efficiency of seaweed feeds. And the bison sector, it seems, is very concerned with sustainability as it is uh, emerging and um, I think it's important, uh, from what I gather, it's important to represent uh, modern or future values in um, developing this new industry. And so it may become important to them to have uh, a feed supply once the sector starts to grow and expand uh, beyond what's, uh, um, uh, I suppose, grazable, um, if they, they are required to develop new feeding programs then they will need a feed supply that is sustainable as well. So I wanted to introduce now the idea that seaweed-based feeds uh, could be, um, and this is according to the, the supplier who's been in business for quite some time, uh, nutritionally superior and um, cost-effective and again, water efficient. And so, this is uh, my very early days of my investigation, but I want to know if I wanted to, um, I suppose, progress the research to the next stages. Is there a center for commercial development or market development or 
Um, I, I suppose the bison sector has proposed that they may be interested in, in conducting research and funding research, but also as this is uh, to encourage the seaweed sector, where can I find funding for the seaweed um, research in terms of, uh, um, and the, the development of the product is the easiest part. It's already doable. The, the uh, marine botanist that I've uh, spoken to is familiar with the diet and familiar with the, the feeding cycles. So they already understand that there's a product that can be, be easily adapted to a bison diet. But um, to actually develop a full program, um, and the, the point of this is to match two emerging markets, um, whereas cattle, for example, has established itself firmly with terrestrial feeds, uh, so a sustainable industry might be interested in a sustainable feed. And I want to marry the two um, emerging industries before terrestrial feeds becomes the, the, um, the um, automatic choice. Thanks, thanks for that, Dominique. I'll let some of our um, panelists potentially respond to that, but I will also let you know if you're following the chat, um, there have been some resources placed into the chat in regards to that topic that might be useful to you. And then I'll kick it back out to the panelists to respond. Well, I can tell you that the University, uh, Penn State University has an active program right now on animal feeds, as well as uh, University of California at Davis. Uh, seaweeds are right in the center of the portfolio. Uh, they're not only working with the so-called miracle seaweed asparagopsis, they're also working with other seaweeds, especially ones that are warm, temperate, and tropical. And so uh, there is a literature, Dominique, that's out there. And I could put a couple of papers for you in the chat, which I will do, and you can see where to start. The other aspect has to do with funding. Uh, SBIR uh, programs, both phases one and two from USDA and NOAA are very good uh, uh, grant opportunities. Uh, even now NSF is encouraging uh, their participants to go and work with uh, companies and they have SBIRs too. So uh, there is, there is information out there. There are funds out there. You have to partner up with an academic institution and go after it. I'll add anecdotally, I used to work out at uh, Catalina Island in Southern California where there is a, a native or introduced bison population and they regularly go down to the beach and, and munch on um, washed up seaweed. So. They like it. So I'm just going to jump in here for a second on the on the Sea Grant side of things. I don't know how much of the audience is already aware that um, Sea Grant actually has a seaweed hub, and I um, thought some of those resources might be useful to the conversation in this call. Um, and so for those of you that aren't aware of it, I wanted to toss the ball to Anushka and have her kind of give a little bit of an overview of some of the resources that Sea Grant might have that might be useful. Hi, thanks, Angela. Um, so Sea Grant um, has 11 aquaculture hubs that were funded in 2019. Um, there's the National Seaweed Hub, um, that's a collaboration of um, 11 Sea Grant programs and their stakeholders um, working together to identify challenges across nine different stakeholder sectors, and then um, identifying commonalities, forming work groups, uh, which um, are diverse stakeholder work groups. So everyone works together to, um, you know, come up with a, uh, um, you know, a pathway or strategy forward on, um, you know, how to address um, certain challenges. And just wanted to highlight um, one of the work groups, the regulations work group, um, has been working on um, addressing food safety and figuring out the different pathways um, where seaweed fits. Um, and so, Seaweed is a RAC, rec uh, a raw agricultural commodity in Connecticut. We developed guidance um, back in um, 2020, um, but it's project starting from 2012, we've been working on seaweed food safety um, in Connecticut and we've always considered it a raw agricultural commodity. Um, 
because our farmers are pretty much selling it um, in its fresh form. Um, and that's considered a raw agricultural commodity. But as a RAC, there's certain food safety guidelines um, and what farmers, uh, different regulations farmers have to um, adhere to. And so um, the regulations work group um, led by the National Cigarette Law Center is developing this document, looking at comparing um, where seaweed fits in under seafood HACCP versus FISMA preventive controls. And so that's going to be a great document when it um, should be coming out hopefully by the spring, um, and by the end of spring, early summer, um, where again, it's just something that a farmer can look at and say, well, I'm doing this one product, but if I want to transition um, into say processing, these are the steps that I would have to follow. Um, so stay tuned, um, that's coming up because it's, it's I think something that as farmers, um, at least the ones I work with, you know, they're very limited because especially in um, Southern New England, since we're selling it in its fresh form, it's a very short harvest season, so two months. And so farmers really wanna extend the shelf life um, of their seaweed. Um, there's challenges with that because we don't really have um, commercial scale processing facilities or safe storage facilities long-term. Um, and that really limits market accessibility. Um, so these are some conversations, again, that are coming out of the Seaweed Hub and, and regulators are talking with farmers and saying, well, what can we do? Um, also wanted to highlight um, that um, there's other aquaculture hubs. The main aquaculture hub has a seaweed um, component to it. The um, WASH or the, the Western Aquaculture Hub or the, sorry, the, the name, I think it's it's led by Washington Sea Grant um, and they have a seaweed component um, as well. So there's a lot of Sea Grant programs um, including the National Sea Grant Law Center that are looking at the policy side of seaweed that have a lot of resources available. Thank you, thank you. All right, esteemed panelists, are there any final comments or any closing remarks or discussion you'd like to move forward with? We we blocked off a large chunk of time for this workshop because we thought that the discussion might be one of the most useful portions. So um, I wanted to kind of kick it back to you guys and see if there's something else that you'd like to talk about. Well, I could say Florida's got a very diverse uh, coastline East Coast, West Coast, and the Florida Straits. And you have a very good opportunity uh, for seaweed cultivation. You also have a need for seaweed cultivation uh, because of the people pressure, the nitrogen pressure that is coming from Florida residents as well as coming from the Mississippi Delta. So I think uh, the seaweed cultivation along with shellfish cultivation offers some unique opportunities for Florida. Yeah, and I would urge you to bring in some other entrepreneurs <clears throat> to come up and really uh, take the lead and uh, look at product development uh, with some of the known seaweeds that are out there right now. The low hanging fruit are your grassalarias. And as I said before, there is a demand and the, and the supply chains were terribly interrupted. The price of augers went through the roof in the last two years. So if there is a, a suitable source, uh, Florida would be able to capture the market. Yeah, I can comment on our SK uh, project. We're hoping to help um, advance some of this by doing some of the nitrogen testing in the water and the nitrogen content in the tissues of the seaweed and um, hopefully answer some of those questions about can we use this for carbon credits or what the quality of that biomass is. And we also um, hope to leverage our offshore farm um, to get some data of, you know, seaweed quality and water quality outside of those shellfish harvesting areas. And I think, um, you know, Charlie was, was really, um, Charlie Culpepper was really helpful with, um, you know, offering to test some of our samples so we can get that data. And so we look forward to, to doing that as well. Uh, yeah, I'll just follow up and thank everybody for joining us and having the conversation. Um, it's great to see all the interest and um, all the feedback. I think I learned, I, I certainly learned a ton today. So um, thanks for everybody that took the time to talk and everybody that joined us.
Yeah. Um, Roizen, did you raise your hand? You can go ahead. I did. Um, it's Roisin. It's a oh, I'm sorry. No, no, it's a crazy Gaelic name. Um, I'm sitting here, uh, actually a Fairfield, Connecticut resident, and snowboarding in Florida. So uh, familiar with both Northeast and down here, and um, wondering as a potential entrepreneur, because this whole thing fascinates me, and and I followed Green Wave for a couple of years, and or more and, and my son and my daughter as well. He's out in Washington state, uh, she's in New York. We really would like to get involved in this, but like, are we years away from someone who does not have a shelf, shellfish farm or does not have a processing plant or, you know, but, uh, but money is there, but regulatory issues and, and, um, you know, marketing issues and everything else. Are are we talking years away or is there an opportunity for someone completely green to get into this? If I could, if I could jump on that, just being from New York, um, and I'm sure it's very similar um, everywhere you go, but the, the first challenge is getting a piece of water when, if you wanna get into aquaculture and getting a, getting a spot to do it. Um, you know, it, in New York, there's public, because a lot of our, uh, or I should say most of our underwater uh, lands are, are public lands. So um, usually, you know, aquaculture happens through some type of public leasing program. And um, in New York, we have a couple. Um, it gets kind of confusing in New York because the South Shore Bays are controlled by towns. The Peconic Estuary is controlled by Suffolk County. The Long Island Sound is state waters. So you're you're always dealing, uh, depending on what body of water, it might be a different agent, a uh, different level of government, um, you know, that you're dealing with. But, um, you know, if step one is to look at, at these public leasing programs and um, get on a waiting list, you know, and yes, it could take a long time, uh, depending on how the, the leasing programs work. Um, uh, and I know there's a long waiting list it's in some of our leasing programs. Um, if you're lucky, you might find private, there is a such thing as privately owned underwater lands. And if you're um, lucky you might, um, uh, you know, find that or know somebody that that owns private water, uh, underwater lands and you could get going a lot quicker that way. Um, you won't be dependent on these on these public leasing programs if that's the case. Um, but then after that, your second hurdle is then getting the off bottom culture permits. And that 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 could be a process. It's getting it's been getting faster since when I started it, um, because now um at the, at the federal level, at the Army Corps, there's nationwide permits that cover uh, shellfish aquaculture and now more, even more recently, seaweed aquaculture. So that's really streamlined that process, you know, but with that said, still in New York, it could take, you know, upwards of six months to a year to, to, uh, to get your full complement of permits from the, from the, at the federal level and the state level. Um, and, um, you know, then, then your final thing is just, you know, getting the, you know, once, once the, you get a spot and you get your permits, it's starting a farm and that could take some time, uh, especially given that some of these crops may take a year to grow um, uh, or longer, you know, when you're talking with, uh, with shellfish. So um, it is a, it is a, uh, it can be a long, arduous process to get going and it makes the uh, it makes it makes a lot of barriers to entry to, to enter the aquaculture business. And, um, uh, you know, I would say, um, you know, uh, for seaweed farming and the future of seaweed farming. And one thing I, I. Uh oh. He'll come back and we'll let him finish. But because we're talking about the regulatory side of things, and I see that Portia's got a hand, her hand up, I'm going to skip the order here and let Portia speak for a second. Mike, when you come back. Oh, Mike, you're back. Sorry, we lost Oh, you. did I drop off? Yeah, you did. Oh, my right, God. Right, I was, it was in the I middle. I didn't even know. I was, talking, I was talking the whole time, so sorry. Um, I don't even know. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, end there. But uh, I don't know what you heard or didn't hear, so I'll just... Uh, I'll drop it. <laughs> okay, um, Portia, did you want to comment on that on that regulatory side real quick? 
Sure. Um, so I just posted in the chat our um, lease parcel availability maps, and you can go, it's a GIS map, so you can go in there and navigate, and it'll show you which parcels are available. So after a lease is terminated in Florida, we still retain those aquaculture parcels for use. So there are parcels that would potentially be available for somebody that wanted to get started. And we can issue those administratively. So that's typically able to be done within a month or shorter. Um, and we are looking at production outside of shellfish harvesting areas. Um, currently with um, FDA, we've been talking with them about areas that don't have additional pollution sources, right? Because they're further offshore from the pollution sources that we're looking at for bacteria. And you know, we're, we're trying to figure out how we can get those not necessarily classified, but how we can allow culture there. Um, so there's not necessarily anything preventing us from doing that. Um, so that can move forward as well. So I think on the regulatory side, the big holdup is just the gear. So currently we're constrained to just the shellfish gear. Um, and I think we're probably three to four years into our permit modification with the core. Um, so hopefully we'll be wrapping that up you know, within the next six months to a year. Hey, hey Portia, can I ask you, if, if we can go outside the SHAs, does that mean the core is involved or could you still do the authorizations without the core? Um, I don't wanna say gumming things up, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Uh, that, I mean, the, the core permit covers state lands in okay. Florida, submerged lands. Um, so that, the language in the permit mod that we put in was not specific for shellfish. Um, now there is, there's other components that are specific to those harvest areas, but we can work to go outside of those. Awesome. Just the Cedar Key shellfish harvesting area extends out nine miles. I mean, Correct. it's huge. It's huge. Yeah, Cedar Key Harvest Area goes all the way out to the, the state line. Um, I think those are the only ones that do that. Thank you for that. Anushka, go ahead. Hi, so um, just also wanted to clarify, just make, make sure you're aware, the permitting process is very nuanced in terms of siting, and that's gonna you know, happen by state. It's very site specific. So even in Connecticut, we have farms that may be in the same town waters, but the permitting process was very specific to each farm. So it's very site specific because um, there's a lot of variables and there could be user conflicts. Uh, you have to figure out what's happening in the water column um, before you put any sort of gear um, in the water. But with that said, Connecticut, is, we're, we're pretty fortunate that we, um, have very specific, but also very set and transparent guide, transparent guidance on the permitting process uh, for all aquaculture, really for any sort of gear that goes in our coastal waterways. Um, and then we also have food safety guidance. Um, so we're pretty much set in Connecticut um, in terms of um, having a process in place. Um, there are, of course, states like Washington, <laughs> where the process is just all over the place. So um, I think it's really just going to depend upon the state and, and the specific site um, that you would like to farm in. Um, but in terms of challenges, um, you know, there's, there's still a lot of challenges. It's still um, an emerging industry in most states. And just to give you an idea of just Connecticut numbers, um, but before I give you Connecticut numbers, um, there's a great presentation on the Seaweed Hub's website called State of the States. And essentially that goes through most of the seaweed farming states. That's mostly for based on sugar kelp, not, not really um, any of the Southern states or, or Gulf of Mexico, or states in Gulf of Mexico, but um, at least not yet. But it sort of gives you information about landings per state, the species that are produced, the per overview of the permitting process, if that's available, um, and where the seaweed being produced um, is going. Um, but to talk about Connecticut, um, you know, the first farm went in the water in 2001, that was a Bridgeport Aquaculture High School. Um, but then, um, then the first commercial farm went in the water in 2012. And actually there was two around the same time that went in the water. Since then, there have been 13 sites permitted specifically for seaweed, but only three farms have been active over the past uh, three years. And so that, that has a lot to do with um, some of the challenges related to access to markets, um, very short growing season, um, lack of processing facilities, uh, long-term safe storage, and even in some cases production, um, you know, access to seed, but also weather. 
related um, challenges. So, you know, again, we're not where shellfish is, right? Um, it's still new, um, but there's a lot of great work happening across the country, a lot of great research, a lot of great work that nonprofits are doing, that Sea Grant's doing, um, just to try and move the industry forward. Um, but, you know, you always have to say, or I always, I always challenge people, you know, when you're starting a business, a seaweed or any sort of aquaculture is a business, right? And so, um, you know, develop, you know, have a good business plan, um, make sure that um, you have uh, really an enterprise budget and a plan over the next few years um, in order to be successful. So just, you know, things to consider, um, you know, if, if you want to be any sort of farmer, um, you know, have backup plan, but essentially, you know, have that market, secure the funding, make sure you're, um, you know, economically viable and economically independent, um, because a lot of um, right now, um, in, in some states, um, some of the farms are subsidized and being supported by subsidized, uh, su subsidiaries. So, so that, that's just, again, just some food for thought. Uh, I want to interrupt one more time. Um, can anybody speak to the the uh, federal program? Uh, I think it was the end of last year. There was a, um, an open call for comment on um, certain legislations for the federal program, and the the overarching. Um, uh, study of the federal program is to decrease the seaweed deficit. And so I would imagine this means that built in the federal program uh, will be ways to accelerate or facilitate uh, the smooth implementation of new farms as a, I suppose, as an undergirding of the state systems or the state um, structures or or businesses. So ha has anybody had an update or um, has any knowledge of where the federal program is in its development? Charlie or Loretta or Scott? Oh. There's the aquaculture opportunity areas that would be for offshore waters that would fall under federal programs and, and they're meant to, to help facilitate. Um, but I don't know that any project has really um, taken advantage of that yet or if they're really implemented yet. So the federal programs only relate to federal waters. They don't relate to the development of US aquaculture as a whole. Right, that's correct. NOAA is working on uh, the plan right now in South Common, and so uh, it's, it's probably uh, will be coming out any time for more public view, but it has been circulating with different uh, state and federal agencies. Okay, great. Thank you, guys. Um, just because I didn't say it verbally later, I know you see at the top of your screen, it says recording, but so everyone knows this presentation has been recorded. If you have said anything that you are uncomfortable with being in the world, definitely send me a private email and let me know that you would like me to edit your portion out. But otherwise I will make this um, workshop public so that folks can click a link and be able to watch the presentations for those of those, um, I know there are a lot of people that wanted to join today and we're not able to make it. So this will live forever online. So take this as your notice if you would like me to, to edit anything out before I post it. That'll probably happen next week at some point. And next week at some point, I will also make sure to send all of the links and communications that we've had in the chat so far um, so that you guys can, can digest that at your own rates. And then I'll also share contact information for all of our panelists today as well. And with that, I am going to let Aaron and Loretta go ahead and, and land their plane here. Um, and and go ahead, guys. I'm going to throw the mic here. Uh, I think I already thanked everybody for showing up. And Angela, thank you for putting everything together and moderating. Awesome job. Appreciate you. Um, appreciate everybody else being here. Uh, 
Angela put up my phone number. I've chatted with a few people directly. Um, feel free to call me anytime. If I don't answer, I'm on the water, but I'll get back to you. Yeah, I'll just second that too. It's been great to, to have this discussion and look forward to further development and learning more as we um, have things in the water and learn more about Florida waters. Yeah, and stay tuned because these guys are still working on their NOAA SK and I suspect there's more research to come in this area. So this is a topic that we'll probably just continue to be discussing for quite some time and it's only gonna get better. So on behalf of everyone here, any any closing remarks from anybody else on our panel? I want to give you the opportunity. Okay, awesome. I'm I'm so glad that everybody joined us today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to speak and share your expertise. Thank you, everyone who's on the call for listening and for asking questions and making the conversation worthwhile. And stay tuned for an email from us moving forward with more information and with links to all of this great stuff that we talked about today. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving next week. Many thanks, Angela. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank thanks, you. Angela. Thanks, Angela. Bye.